Hello, and welcome to episode 17 of the postcast with Rabbi Shmuel Posner and myself, Seth Hellman. Rabbi, how are we doing today? Baruch Hashem, it's Rosh Chodesh Elo. Happy Rosh Chodesh, everybody. Hard to believe we're at 17 when we did number one and two. Who would have thought that we come to number 17? 17 is the gematria of the word toiv or tov, which means good. So this will be a good Rosh Chodesh and hopefully a good postcast. So the rabbi has been working as a handyman, apparently, because he's been installing grandchildren. I don't know how how versed in pop culture many of you are, but there was this movie in my childhood, and I think it was just called Robots. And part of the movie was these two robots, right? All the people in this movie are robots, right? It's like an animated thing. And these two people get married, and they're living together, and they decide they want to have a baby. And the way the robots make a baby is it gets shipped in a box and they have to assemble it, you know, and like build it. And so that's what my my brain went to when you told me grandchild installment as the first order of business on today's post. <laughs> I didn't install the grandchild, but, you know, like an installment, like every an update, a thing that's going on. So I and I can't promise it's going to be a weekly thing. You know, if, if it happens, it happens, you know, you can't. But um, I was visiting our grandchild in Hamden, Connecticut, near New Haven, Chaya and Maishi's um, oldest son. And his issue was, he was talking to his father and wanted to know who made Hashem. Because everybody, somebody has to make everything. So if Hashem makes everything, who makes Hashem? And actually, they, they were off on a trip somewhere and they came home, it was like nine o'clock at night and he still was, you know, Wants to know who made Hashem, and it's a it's an interesting question. Now we know we know as adults that the which is a good question. Like the Rambam talks about this and says, like the beginning of Mishnah Torah, says that Hashem is the first is the source of all things. Everything comes from Hashem. Hashem doesn't come from anything. Nothing beats Hashem. If if nothing exists, Hashem exists. If Hashem doesn't exist, nothing exists. That, that whole business of First cause. So I'm thinking like, oh, to an adult, I could explain this simply. Everything has to be, there has to be some, something that, something that isn't caused by anything else. We call that kadma in, in, in Hebrew or first cause in English. So it's got to be a first cause that it causes everything, but nothing causes it. I mean, that's the beginning of it. Then the whole involvement of God in the world is a separate subject, which is really connected, but we don't have to get, go there. The first step is not that there's a first cause. Then I'm thinking, how do I tell this to a five-year-old? <laughs> and I thought about it for a while, I mean, more than a minute, because I had to answer him. And I said to him that Hashem is different than everything else. Nothing makes Hashem, because Hashem is just different. And I thought that that was something, you know, what am I going to tell him? That everything has a cause, but there's got to be a first cause that doesn't come from anything else. He doesn't understand. The question is, every everything comes from something. So I, I thought the only way that he'd be able to be able to wrap his mind around it is to understand that Hashem is different. And I think a child at that age, I think it's very important when you raise children that sometimes you tell them things that they can't understand. In other words, you say to them, you can't understand this. Or, you know, you say, oh, you'll, when you find out when you're older. But that's true. That, that you know, there are things that, that can't be understood where you are right now, you can't understand that. And I think children have that ability to accept that, obedience. That's really what it's all about, it's about obedience. Essentially, children, like we talk about, do children want order or not want order? And the fact of the matter is that children like to have order. They want to know that things, somebody's in control. They don't like, you know, children like, oh, we'll run around, whatever we want to do, da 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 da, da. But really what they're looking for is guidance, you know, stru structure. A safety. So I think this. I thought that was. A, I thought that was a fascinating question. I should be thinking about these type of things. And but I think the answer was that good answer. Which essentially we we as adults are the same thing too. Do we know we don't understand Hashem completely? It's impossible. Hashem is greater than us. Hashem is the Creator. He precedes us. So there's no that we can understand God. You know, and say we got God. God doesn't fit into our brain. God doesn't fit into the universe. The universe fits into Hashem. 
Shem is infinite, whatever, the whole thing. So I think that, that's an important point. We spoke about raising children last time and time before, showing them my examples. That's one thing. Now here's another lesson number two in child rearing. Sometimes you have to let them know that what the boundaries are. Boundaries about crossing the street when the red is, when light is green, not running, you know, holding Tati or mommy, daddy, mommy's hand when they're crossing. Then you also in their mind, you got to say like, okay, there are certain things you can know, certain things you can't know. In our society, there's like this thing, we got to tell our children everything. You don't got to tell our children everything. They don't, don't want to know. They feel safe or not knowing. Oh, they want to know everything. They don't want to know everything. Okay, the question is what you tell them. But I think in this case, we just put in his mind that there's something that's much greater than we know, and therefore we can't understand everything about it. That was that. So you mentioned Please. it. Huh? Yeah, it's, it's a very deep conversation, or I don't want to call it a conversation, I guess, because it's just you talking. But yeah, it's it's something to think about. Right. I like that question, though. Who who made Hashem? Yeah, right. But I like where the kid's head is at. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's good, yeah. That is, that is, um, you know, it's more difficult to s explain something simply than it is to explain it in a more complete, you know, like you talk about the, the brilliance of a good professor is not that he can tell you all these terms that, are, that you don't really understand, but to bring it down into simple language that anybody can understand. That's what I tell people. If you're learning Gemara, and you wonder, I, I hope nobody gets upset about this. If you could explain, if you come home from yeshiva and you could explain to your mother what you learned and she understands it, then you understand it. Which, by the way, every teacher is like that as well. If, you, if you're a teacher teaching something, you don't understand it, and you start asking the teacher questions, and they don't, you'll find out they don't really get it. They don't got, they don't understand it themselves that clearly. I know <laughs> when I give a class, I know when it's a good class, not because of the feedback of the students or something. I know how well I know the subject, how comfortable I'm with it. That's how comfortable the students are going to get. They're going to they're going to hear it. It's going to come out in a way that that that's, that you understand it, they'll understand it as well. When you're teaching something, you haven't prepared, you don't really know that well. You know, the best thing is to say, look, I don't really understand this, but so then then they're with you. Yeah. So bring it down to a child's level. You have to see what things could that child understand. And and stay in terms that the child can actually understand, and not to belittle them, not to make it into the, you know below them. Got to get them right, right, you know, right where they're at. So that was a um, wonderful opportunity to interact with little Mendy Hecht. By the way, on this podcast, postcast, we do we 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 use names. <laughs> names will be be used. Yeah, we, we we discussed this in like the very early episodes yes, <laughs> that that, that names that. would be we dropped. Yeah, we that. You know, names will be dropped if you if you you're vulnerable. You got to be vulnerable if you come with the postcast. Actually, <laughs> I was in Crown Heights yesterday, and the shliach that says to me, I was in the shluchim office. They have a they have a special building for shluchim. You know, to help them with old programs. They have like a lounge with a table with low computers, little snack bar. You know, get some work in Crown Heights, get some work done in Crown Heights. And it was a uh, so guy, he says to me, Oh, so he makes throws out something about the postcast. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is from a guy from uh Portland, Oregon, where mayor is. So the postcast is known. All right, let's move on to Rosh Chaydesh Elo. Yeah, the holidays are coming. We're 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 less than like 30 days away from Rosh Hashanah. We are, I would say exactly 30 days. Is it exactly 30? I yeah, know that. It, well, is it? Isn't it the on the, the first of Tishrei? I thought it, is it? Does it start the fifteenth? the The night of the fifteenth or the? It starts Friday night. I the, not helpful. You know what night? You want to know what night it is? You want to know what night it is? It's the yep fifteenth. The night after the fifteenth, Friday night. So it's close. Very close. It's coming, yeah, 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 yeah. So, and not only that, but um, Elul is the time to prepare for, for Rosh Hashanah, obviously. You're not going to wait for after, you know, like we spoke about this last week, I think. But the the word, El, you know, let's talk about this for a minute, if you don't mind here. You know, getting ready for holidays, like, oh, my God, everybody's like, oh, I got to get ready, got to ready. So I, I was thinking about this, about, you know, 
in some yeshivas, not Chabad yeshivas, like the rabbi will get up on Rosh Chodesh El and will bang on the beam and say, Elo! Like, like throw the fear of God in them. Elo! You know, Elo's coming! Oh my God, Elo's coming! And Echamah, we don't do that. <laughs> it's an awesome time, but the famous analogy that the Rebbe gives is about the king in the field. Everybody knows that. The king is in the field, meaning that the king could be in the palace, and then to get into the king, you have to, you know, get dressed up and you have to go through, you know, get have an appointment. And sometimes he meets you. And then before the king gets into, gets into the palace, he's in the field. And all the fields people are working in the field, but the king is there. They can approach the king. So the month of El is similar to that. It's, it's, it's a regular month. You have six days you work. Shabbos is Shabbos, obviously. But this gives you an opportunity to meet the king where you're at. In other words, in your daily activity, Hashem is there. And Hashem, you know, and I, I always like this because it always comes out, it comes out in like campaigning time. Like so all the presidential candidates, not this year, but, but next year, they'll be out there. And everybody can walk over and talk to them. Even now, if you go to uh, Iowa, you go to New Hampshire, New Hampshire, you have all the candidates come running there and you and they, they schmoozing around like your best friend. Wait till they become president. You can't get to them. So Lahabdil, Hashem is like that. Now Hashem is like right there. You want to wait for Rosh Hashanah, like all the angels are, are lining up and they're checking your credentials. Here Hashem is right with you. So it's actually a wonderful time. Elo is like, you, you know, you look for it, like, it's, it's a powerful time, but it's a wonderful time. It's, it's a time of introspection, which really what, what the word El actually means. If you look in the Torah, when it talks about the spies went to Israel to spy out Israel. So there's Unklus, which is an interpretation of the Torah into Aramaic. And he used, and the word he uses for, for spying for, is Elu, Alilu, spelled exactly, almost, it's spelled the same way, Aleph Lamed, um, Vav Lamed, Elu. So the idea of introspection is what comes in Elu. And then just, you know, moving closer to Hashem and, and getting, your, getting, your, getting your stuff in order. But it's a good time. It's a good time. It's a, it's a time to connect. It's a, you know, it's not, it's not a scary time. Hashem loves us. Hashem wants to get along. You know, if you have a good friend that, that you haven't seen in a while, you're not afraid to meet them because, oh, why don't you call me? Why don't you send me a letter? They're happy to see you. They, they're already ready to overlook everything. So El is a good time. Rosh Chodesh is a pretty powerful time as well. When you think about it, we go, we, we, we go by the moon, right? So our shoulders is when the moon first becomes visible. Then it grows and grows and grows till the 15th day that it's full. And then it recedes. You start seeing less and less and less. And that happens every month. It starts small, gets bigger, gets, and then gets full, and then, de then declines again. Why is that? Because we know when the moon gets full, oh, that's a great time. We talk about the 15th of Av, the moon is full. That means that the, that represents the Jews. So why does it get smaller? So it should be like every month is like happy and then gets sad. Why don't we just keep on getting bigger? You know, in, in life, what do we say? Keep on progressing always. You don't say like progress and then stop, recede. No, keep on going. So what's this idea of half the month the moon gets smaller? That's like a, that sounds very negative, very bad. So Chassis explains that when it gets smaller. It means you're diminishing yourself to be able to do something even bigger. It's like, for example, when you, when you want to jump, you step back. So the stepping back is not stepping back away from the goal, but it's empowering you to get further when you actually jump. Like, you know, like runners do that, or people that do these big, you know, jumps, these pole vault jumpers. They will step, run, start way back, run forward, and then jump. So this diminishing, and especially talking about relationship to Hashem, because ultimately the major ingredient in relationship to God is diminishment of self. What do you mean diminishment of self? That bitl. you don't what? Bit <laughs> <laughs> exactly, bitl. <laughs> because the big, the more you are, the less you are in connection to Hashem. The less you are, the more you are. There you go. Exactly the point. So when you get you get big, I pay attention sometimes. I know it's amazing. It's amazing, God. So I'm so happy. So the smaller you get, the bigger you become. The big more of a vessel you are for Hashem. And life works that way, also, just in, in general. You know, people, you can't stay on a constant high. 
Sometimes you go come down, but you come down to regroup and, and like you know the flow, the ebb and flow of life. So that's Rosh Chodesh El is one of those like for the whole year. Like now is like time to get ready. Then we'll jump into the new year in a much more empowered way. So that's uh, that's yeah, that's Rosh Chodesh El. And, and now of course every every time you write a letter or you greet somebody. Wishing people a happy, healthy new year. So it gets people into the mode of, of introspection, reflection, and then resolution. The main thing is to go forward in a good way, take on new things. It's, it's you know, it, it's it's funny that you say that because now that I'm thinking about it, I think this is gonna be the first time that I'm home for Sukkot in like four years, the way things are looking right now. Well, let me just say we have a space for you at the Chabad house. Of course, of course. You are welcome. Okay, what are we else? Oh, the big story. <laughs> I can only imagine, based on the theme of the stories that we get from the rabbi, that you lost your keys <laughs> and that Khani had to bail you out and get you back into something. <laughs> okay, now full disclosure to to the listeners, to the devoted listeners of the postcast. I did not tell Seth anything about this story except that there's me a story about keys. So he knew nothing, and yet he knows so much. And I want to I'm, I'm going to make one provision here, and this is that you are not allowed to make any comments that in any way can indicate any disparagement of men or women, ladies or gentlemen, who are in an advanced age. <laughs> it's not my fault that you're ancient yeah you want to hear the story you better sign yeah it the story didn't start yet you see <laughs> so i'm just it's a condition so here it goes okay. not, the condition just... doesn't come into effect until you give me the story right it's like a get <laughs> we just finished get and i know i know oh, all no. about the condition <laughs> anyway here's the story so the story was um the girls are home and a couple of the younger girls and had to take them to New York, came to New York. Everything's fine. Went to the oil, came to Crown Heights. And I came to my brother. We're staying in our brother's house, the Sheikhit. And maybe we'll have him on one day as a guest. Anyway, but so it was Tuesday night, right? So... I'm looking for a place to give, the, there's a Talmud on Tuesday class, which is the, the Cambridge class, which now is held on Zoom every Tuesday night, 7.45. And I went downstairs to the basement. No, that's not a good, it wasn't, wasn't the right place. Dining room, sit down in the dining room, give the class. And it was wonderful, great class, everything's fine. And then I get up and it's okay, I'm going to go to Shul now, go to 770, down my, put on my hat and jacket. And all instinctively, I, I, you know, I, I put my phone into my pocket or something, and I feel for my key to the car, because I said, you know, just not, I wasn't driving, I just like, you know, you want to know things are in place. That's the way I am. Key's not there. So where's the key? Can find the key to the car. So now I, now I drove the car to his house, and you can't drive the car if you don't have the key. And the key and the car is locked. So it's unlikely or almost impossible for the key to be in the car because then the doors won't lock. So where is the key? So the only possibility is that from the time I left the car and came to the house, I dropped the key somewhere. Okay. Now, and I, I you know, it's in my pocket. It, it would be, how does it get out of my pocket that I, that I should drop it? So I, I couldn't retrace the very short space between the car and the house. It's not there. I knew exactly where it was in the house. So I came to the house, ate dinner in the kitchen, came to the dining room and gave the class. I wasn't wandering around, you know, in any other rooms. I knew exactly which rooms I were in. He cannot be found. And now this is, this is an issue. This is a problem. So my brother goes into mode very calmly. He's making phone calls, finding out who could make a new key, right? Because Khan is in Portland. So, and the keys, the other, the other keys in Boston, all right? Hey. So you'll, you'll hear Khani's role in a second. So he starts making phone calls. And first thing is that, you know, maybe the keys, the keys in the car, even though it, it doesn't work that way, but who knows? Maybe, maybe, maybe. 
So we call Haverim. Everyone knows what Haverim is. It's, it's, it's true. Okay. We go out to the car, and these two young guys come, and nice, you know, they're probably 20 years old, 18, 19, 20, whatever, about that age. And they proceed to show me how you can get into a car hmm. without a key, which I can't, I can't publicize now. But, they, you know, you basically got to get, you know, move, open the door a little bit and stick this metal thing in. And a patch could around him and here, you know, one guy couldn't do it. He called his friend, his cane. It took them a little while. They popped open the car. Okay, fine. There's no key inside. Because you, if it was key was inside, you could start the engine. So the key's not there. Okay. Take out the the, the um, suitcase that we needed for the night. The car is there. Call a guy. So if he get my my brother gets a, a number of somebody who makes keys. And he talks and talks to him, and the guy says, oh, by the way, I'm in Mexico. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> That's not going to help us till he gets back. Finds another guy. He can do it in the morning. It's going to cost a few hundred dollars. That, that's because it's like this electronic key would all better. And uh, I said, okay, hey. Meantime, here's where Hani comes in. She calls. She spoke to her friend in Boston who's coming to New York. I said, what time is she coming? I, I, you know, we're supposed to, this is Tuesday night, we're supposed to leave Wednesday, get some, you know, do some errands and leave. She's actually leaving Boston at five o'clock in the morning. I said, oh, this is great. She'll be in, she'll be in New York, like nine, 10 o'clock. That's great. Now we got to get the key to her. So her husband actually wasn't going with her. He drives to the house, to the Chabad house, gets the key and brings her the key. Okay. So now the, the key's on the way to New York. And I go to sleep. Go to sleep. Of course, I wake up, <clears throat> I'm up at like six o'clock in the morning, and I hear my brother shouting, which is like not normal because everybody else is sleeping in the house. I got the key, I found the key, I found the key. <laughs> like, oh wow. <laughs> well, I guess the moral of the story is that you grabbed the wrong jacket and you you looked down, you saw it had the little yellow pin on it, and you were like, Oh, this is not my jacket, and it was actually in your actual. Wow, jacket. that's very good. Very good from that phone who didn't notice. So in the dining room, right? So I came down and I put my jacket over here at one side of the table, my hat next to it. He had his hat jacket on, on next to on the table and his hat. Now, of course, our hats are both black hats. <laughs> yeah, they're identical. Jackets happen to also be the same color, which means no color. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it was you have the same nose, you have the same ears, you probably have the same beard, you probably have the same haircut, you probably have the same glasses. Not exactly. And you haven't met my brother. Anyway. That's true. I haven't happened, met brother. So we don't know what happened. So here's here's the mystery. Here's the mystery. I, I assume I sat down to give the class, the Tama class, and I don't like having things in my pocket when I teach. It gets me nervous. So I probably took out the key and put it into my jacket pocket. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. My brother had put on his jacket at night because he went to go to my room when I was in the middle of the class. The question is, why didn't he find the key the night before on Tuesday night? We're to save everybody all this hassle. This is a mystery. This we don't know. There's no answer to this. So now, now one of the things, there is a thing called Rameir Baal Hanes. He's Rameir from the Gemara. It's a long story how there was a miracle that happened. And one of the things that is about it is if you lose something, you're supposed to give tzedakah and you're, you're supposed to say, Elakad the mayor. Anani, the God of Rabbi Meir, which means Hashem, should answer me. So both my sister-in-law and my brother said, you know, you should give some money to da, 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 da. And I said, hey, you know, give to Doc. I said, I did that. Of course, my sister-in-law says, in the morning, she says, did you, did you do that to Doc? I think I said, yeah, ah, I knew it was going to help. I knew it was going to help. <laughs> <laughs> so here, here are the last, here's the lessons from the key story. Number one. Number one is, and I, I got to tell you that I was calm the entire time, like at night. I didn't flip out, oh my God, where's the key? And, I, and somehow I had this feeling, you know, when something's lost, you know, let's say you, you, you drop something into the ocean. It's lost. You know it's lost. Here I knew that it, things don't disappear. So it's got to be somewhere. It's impossible that this disappeared. Question was, now, of course, the answer was so simple and so obvious, which normally things are like that. When the most obvious thing you overlook, like, well, why would I look at my brother's jacket? It's his private. I would never, never put my hands on my brother's jacket. It's his own. And I'm like, what am I doing there? Like, is it? And I saw it 20 times, walked around it, but I didn't think of putting it into there. So here's the lesson. 
in Elul. People are are looking for something in life. Guess what? You know what you you know what you're really missing in life if you feel empty. It's right in you. It's your neshama. We keep on looking for satisfaction somewhere else to do something, to go somewhere. You know, let's go on vacation, go somewhere really crazy place, you know, get onto a plane for 10 hours. Da, 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 da. That's not the way, that's not the way it's gonna work. The way the way it works is when you're able to find inner peace in yourself, then everything works out fine. And I and I realize, and I, you know, I, th- I thought I thought it was so amazing. The other thing was that, that that really got me was the people that jumped in to help. Like these guys, these chaveim are unbelievable. It's like ten o'clock at night, and I call the guy. The, the, you know, they have your number. You call, and the guy says, "You know, they're going to be." It's a little why because there's two other calls in front of you. And you know, and then they came, and while they were there, they, they got another call for something else. One of the guys left. I'm thinking, like, you know, these these, these selfless people that just want to help other people. Um, it just is, is incredible. And and the shluchim here in, in Boston that went driving at ten, you know, eleven o'clock at night to get the key and to bring it. So these are the shluchim from Needham, whose um, daughter is getting married next week. The Krinskys, name dropping, mazel uh-huh. tov to them. Mazel tov. So I, you know, so a couple of powerful lessons that came from that from that um, little story, and and this one you love the most. So after my brother, he, you know, he's so excited to find it because he was so invested in you know help help me out that at six o'clock in, my, in the morning he's like shouting in the house. He goes off to Davin, he comes back from Davin, and he says to me, ah, now you have some material for the postcast. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think actually, he didn't say, I think he said, you did it specifically to have something for the postcast. <laughs> Wouldn't put it past you. Would not put it past you. <laughs> so that's the lesson from the key story. Uh-huh. everything is there if you just look for, you have to know how to look for it the Torah is the guide to happiness to health to everything and it's right there just got to look into it when a Jew is in need other Jews will jump in to help them we are like one big family and so as we prepare for the month of El I think this is you know a very meaningful story to be inspire us to do exactly what El wants us to do look inside yourself find the Jew in you let it express itself, and that's the best preparation for Rosh Hashanah, and help another Jew as well. Amen. And with that, that's all the time we have for episode 17 of the Posecast. Rabbi Shmuel Posner, thank you so much for joining us. We'll probably be back at Wednesday next week at our normal time. A little bit of a kerfuffle, obviously, with the rabbi losing his key, causing us, <laughs> I assume, to not record <laughs> yesterday. But we'll be back Next week, different time, but the same time as normal and same place.